Hi everyone, I'm Steve Tatarunas, Technical Support Manager here at Listen Inc. And thank you all for joining us for today's Microphone Measurement Basics webinar. So when you think about it, we're surrounded by microphones in our daily lives. Um, whenever I do a presentation like this, I like to ask people to think about how many microphones that you have in your house, because I did that exercise a while ago, and I kind of lost track at around 20, 25. We have microphones in our phones, our tablets, our smart speakers, um, you know, even in our television cable remotes. Now I can just talk to it and tell it what channel I want to watch. So everything has voice control nowadays. It's in our cars, it's in our homes, it's in our workplace. And our dependence on microphones and high quality microphones is increasing every day. So it's really important for the people that are consuming these microphones uh, to be able to get high quality consistent microphones for their own products and that's a little bit what we're going to talk about here today and we're going to start off um, with a, a brief discussion of how a microphone actually works we're going to talk about different microphone types and their characteristics then we'll review some specifications and critical microphone measurements we'll talk about microphone test environments and microphone test methods and we'll make some measurements using sound check. And at the end, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. And you can ask a question at any time by typing it into the GoToMeeting chat window and pressing Enter. And we'll review and answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. So if anything comes up during the course of my presentation here today, feel free to enter a question and we'll answer it at the end. So the first part here is how does a microphone work? And in really simple terms, it's sort of like the opposite of a loudspeaker. Um, and in this case, I'm going to use a, a dynamic speaker and a dynamic microphone as an example. So in this cutaway, we're seeing a dynamic loudspeaker and it's converting an electrical signal to an acoustical signal. So we input our um, electric signal it goes through the voice coil, it interacts with the magnetic field, it moves the diaphragm, and it creates sound waves. And on the other end, we've got our dynamic microphone. And the sound waves hit the diaphragm, it moves the coil in the magnetic gap, and it creates uh, an electrical signal that's analogous to the acoustical signal that was captured by the diaphragm. So that's a real simple explanation. Now there's three main microphone types that we're going to talk about today. And as we just saw, there's the dynamic microphone. We're also going to talk about the condenser microphone. And within the condenser microphone group, there's a couple of different classes. And we have the pure condenser microphone, as well as the electric condenser, or pre-polarized. And lastly, there's the MEMS microphone, the Microelectromechanical System microphone. And we'll talk about that as well. And these are essentially very, very small miniature electric condenser microphones that have some associated electronics and perhaps analog to digital converters. And they come in digital and analog types. All right, so um, let's move on with a quick discussion of the dynamic microphone. We already touched on that a little bit in a previous slide. And um, it's essentially, again, a loudspeaker in reverse, right? Um, it has a diaphragm, a voice coil, and a magnetic circuit. And uh, the diaphragm motion produces an analogous electrical signal. Now the pros of the dynamic microphone is that it's very rugged, it can handle very high SPL, it doesn't need any sort of external power, it's very versatile, and it's relatively cheap. So we see lots of dynamic microphones used in live sound applications. Anybody up there on stage holding a vocal mic, they're probably holding a dynamic. It's very rugged, it can get uh, beat up and pushed around and still perform at a very high level. The cons are, because the diaphragm is so heavy, it impacts the usable frequency response. Uh, and the transit response generally isn't that good, and the sensitivity is also generally on the low side. 
So there's the dynamic mic, and now let's talk a little bit about condenser microphones. So condenser microphones are similar to a capacitor, and it has a flexible diaphragm and a rigid or fixed back plate that are electrically charged or polarized. And when sound waves hit the diaphragm, changing the distance between the two surfaces, that produces an AC voltage. So that's where our signal is coming from, is the actual change in distance between the two charged plates. Now in the electric condenser, it has the same theory of operation as the pure condenser design, but the diaphragm and the back plate have a permanent electrical charge embedded in them, so we don't need any sort of electrical, um, outside electrical bias. And these are commonly referred to as pre-polarized microphones. And in fact, the Listen SCM3 is an electric condenser microphone. Now, the pros of condenser microphones is that they have very light diaphragms, and so they can be very sensitive, and they can have extremely extended frequency response, and they can be quite small in design. Uh, the cons are that the max signal levels are limited by the onboard electronics. They're very delicate, and they're very affected by the environment, temperature, humidity, and require signal conditioning due to their very high output impedance. So, also in condenser microphones, the diaphragm size affects the performance of the microphone in a couple of ways. So, in a very large diaphragm microphone, we can get very high sensitivity, but very limited frequency bandwidth. And conversely, in a small diaphragm microphone, we're going to have very low sensitivity, but with the trade-off that we can have very extended frequency bandwidth, so we can measure out to very high frequencies. And in this next graph, I have a, uh, a, a little depiction of this, right? So we have three families of microphones on the graph. Up here on top, we have uh, one-inch microphones that have very high sensitivity, but very limited frequency bandwidth. They really don't have much response out beyond uh, 20 kilohertz. Down below here are uh, representations of some half-inch microphones. And their response is a little bit more extended out to higher frequencies, but you can see the trade-off here is that they're not as sensitive. And down on the bottom here, this uh, very last response curve is representative of a quarter-inch uh, reference microphone. And you can see wh while the um, sensitivity is very low compared to the other microphones, it has extremely extended frequency response, in this case out to 100 kilohertz. So those are some of the trade-offs. It's always a, a bit of a balancing act in microphone design with sensitivity versus uh, extended frequency response. Now, as I mentioned earlier, condenser microphones require some sort of external power supply. And uh, on this slide here, we're showing a couple examples of Listen products. Uh, on the left side is the Listen Sound Connect, a single channel microphone power supply. And on the right is the Sound Connect 2, a dual channel power supply. And we'll be using that in today's uh, demonstration a little bit later when we're making some actual microphone measurements. And the reason we need a power supply is, uh, number one, we need to do some impedance matching to the audio interface. So the power supply handles some of this. Uh, we also need to provide bias voltage to the microphone preamp. We may have the need for signal path gain, so the uh, power supply usually has some sort of a gain stage. And frequency filtering, either a high pass or a low pass filter. So now let's talk a little bit about MEMS microphones. And as uh, we said earlier, um, these are miniature microphones. And what I'm showing here on the screen is a um, a United States coin. It's a quarter dollar coin and it has a diameter of about 25 millimeters. And next to it is a typical MEMS microphone and it's quite small in comparison. So, you know, just eyeballing this here, the MEMS mic uh, is probably a package size of about five millimeters. So there's a lot of advantages to MEMS mics because they can be put into very small spaces.
So as I mentioned earlier, there are two classes of MEMS mics. There are the analog MEMS, and their uh, benefits here is that they have very straightforward interface to the host circuit. Uh, there's an amplifier stage built into the MEMS package. So it has a very inherently usable signal level and very low output impedance. Now the digital MEMS has a converter. So we're taking the analog signal from the microphone and converting it to a digital stream, a PDM stream. And the advantages of PDM are low electrical noise immunity, bit error tolerance, and a very simple interface to the host. But MEMS microphones, digital MEMS, require a very specialized test interface. So the MEMS microphone test interface needs to convert the one bit PDM stream output to a 24 bit 48K PCM. Um, it should have a programmable clock which allows you to measure microphone performance relative to sample rate. It should have a programmable power supply so we can measure performance relative to the supply voltage. And in some cases, we may have a power supply rejection impairment generator so we can measure PSRR, power supply rejection ratio. So let's talk a little bit about the MEMS interfaces from Listen's partner, Portland Tool and Die. And there's actually two of these interfaces. There's the DC1448, which is designed for research and development. And there's the PQC3048 for production line testing. And at this point, I'd like to switch over to a spec sheet to show you the actual difference between these two instruments. So in this specifications and comparison table, um, over here in the first column, we have all of our different specs, clock modes, clock direction, etc. cetera. Uh, one column, has all of the metrics for the DCC1448, and the other one has the PQC3048 data. So you'll see in some cases, um, both devices share the same specs. Um, in, in this case, the PDM data input range is the same for both instruments. But you'll see that in many cases, um, the DCC will have a lot of features that the PQC does not, or the PQC may just have a limited range of features compared to the DCC. So um, in other words, the clock logic uh, can be anywhere from 1.4 to 5.5 volts, and it's independent for the DCC, and the PQC is always locked to the VDD level. Um, the DCC has selectable capacitance. Uh, the PQC is fixed. Uh, the DCC has both SPDIF and USB interface, while the PQC only has a USB. So the PQC is really designed for uh, production line testing of MEMS microphones. It doesn't have all the features of the DCC, but it has all the ones that you really want on a production line. It comes in a very small package at about half of the price of the DCC. So now that we've discussed the different microphone types, let's talk a little bit about microphone test environments. And we'll start out with R&D, or research and development. And uh, on this particular slide, we're, we're showing two of the most common uh, configurations. The first one's an anechoic chamber, if you're lucky enough to have one. And not everybody does, but that's the uh, perfect place to measure a microphone. You can set up your reference speaker, set up your um, reference mic or your device under test and uh, measure all day long and get some really nice measurements. But if you're not lucky enough to have an anechoic chamber in your facility, an anechoic box like this Brule and Care 4232 is also a perfectly good uh, measurement environment for testing microphones. Uh, it contains its own full range speaker and it has some connections on the rear for passing microphone signals in and out as well as a connection for the source speaker itself. 
and it is very well acoustically isolated so outside noise interference really isn't an issue and it's also very well damped on the inside so there aren't a lot of reflections in the box so we can make some very accurate measurements in a very small space so this is a really handy device also for R&D we might have a need to use some more specialized uh, pieces of test equipment uh, and on this slide we're showing a head and torso simulator uh, the Brule and Care hats or uh, similar and uh, a mouth simulator, the Brule and Care 4227, or similar to that. And these specialized fixtures are used for testing um, voice communication microphones. Um, so imagine, if you will, uh, testing a communications headset with a boom mic. Uh, we can test the receiver and the boom microphone by mounting it on the head and torso simulator. And on the, um, the right-hand side of this slide, we're actually showing a test of a smart speaker. So we're testing the smart speaker's microphone array, and we're probably sending some voice commands to it to see how well those commands can be received. And maybe even in the room, we have some um, speakers that are uh, creating some noise or other interference um, to test the quality of the microphone array to reject outside noise and recognize speech. So that's R&D. Production's an entirely different animal. There really aren't any off-the-shelf production line microphone test fixtures. So these types of fixtures are typically custom made to suit the manufacturer's need. And the real important things to consider here when creating a test environment for a production line is number one, uh, acoustic isolation. Um, and positioning repeatability is extremely important. So you always need to be able to mount the um, microphone under test in the same position relative to the uh, source speaker. And also, it's always good practice to measure in the near field to maximize the signal to noise ratio of your measurement. Now let's talk a little bit about microphone specifications and the important ones. So obviously frequency response is important. We need the frequency response of our microphone to at least match the range of signals that we want to capture and record. It should be relatively flat without any coloration. Um, it's always good to know the sensitivity of our microphone and its impedance and its directivity, how well it receives or rejects sounds coming at it from uh, different locations. Um, it may be helpful to know the polarity of the microphone. Uh, so if we present a positive sound wave to the diaphragm, what is the state of the electrical signal coming out of the microphone? Is it going to give us a positive or a negative impulse? Dynamic range of a microphone is very useful to know, as well as its signal to noise and its self noise, and also the type of polarization or bias required to use the microphone. So we talked a little bit about polar patterns, and let's talk about this for a few minutes here. It's a characterization of how the microphone accepts or rejects sounds coming from different directions. Um, and to measure this, we mount the microphone on a turntable and we rotate it using a fixed sound source. On uh, this diagram here, we show some of the more common types of polar patterns. Uh, we have an omni mic that picks up sound coming from any direction equally, a cardioid mic that rejects sounds coming from the rear, a subcardioid uh, accepts a little bit more of the sound coming from the rear but more dominated by sound from the front. We have our bi-directional or figure eight that picks up sound from the front and rear but rejects sounds from the side. A hypercardioid is a bit of an extension of that and a shotgun mic, which is very, very directional. It really only picks up signals from where we're pointing the microphone. Uh, directionality is controlled by back wave cancellation, and it's also very frequency dependent due to the size of the wavelength. And really, we're going to touch on this a little bit more in our next microphone webinar, when we can talk a little bit more about um, how to design your microphone to achieve certain polar patterns, and then actually also how to make these polar measurements themselves. All right, so now let's talk about test methods. And there are three standard methods for microphone test. Uh, the first is the substitution method, 
where we take a known calibrated microphone and measure it, and then we replace it with the unknown microphone that we want to characterize. And then once we've made these two measurements, we can use some post-processing and sound check to calculate the duct mic response. So we can get the frequency response, the uh, sensitivity, and the phase. The second method is the equalized source speaker method, where first we'll equalize our source speaker using a known calibrated reference microphone. And then we can replace the reference mic with the dot mic and perform our measurement. And the third test method is the two-channel transfer function method. And it's very similar to substitution, but the reference and the dot microphones are measured simultaneously. So here are two schematic diagrams of the microphone measurement setups that would be used for the equalized speaker method and the substitution and two-channel method. So over here on the left, we're showing the equalized speaker method. We have our source speaker, our audio amplifier, our audio interface, and our dot microphone, and our host computer. So it's a very, very simple uh, test setup. Over here for substitution and two-channel, it's a little more complicated because we need to use two of the inputs on the audio interface, uh, but otherwise things are pretty much the same. We have our audio amplifier, and we have our speaker to play the test signal and our dot mic and our reference mic. And they may be used simultaneously or sequentially, depending on whether or not we're doing substitution or two-channel. So there are some trade-offs between these test methods, and let's talk about those for a few minutes. So the substitution method really needs a very stable reference speaker. And I've come back to um, this photo that we used a few slides earlier and zoomed in a little bit on the test setup. And in this case, the manufacturer is using a very high quality tannoy um, powered monitor. And it's a coaxial design, so the tweeter is nested inside of the woofer to create a point source. So this is very important. You could either use a coax like this or a very high quality full range speaker as long as it covers the uh, measurement range that you're trying to measure across. So the, the higher quality the speaker, the better. Also the positioning of the microphones and the substitution method is very, very important because it's critical that once we make the measurement with the reference microphone that we're able to place the microphone under test in the exact same position. And how can we do this? We could probably do this with a combination of uh, laser positioning, and we could also monitor the auto delay values that are, that are produced by sound check to guarantee that the microphones are in exactly the same position, exactly time aligned. The equalized source method, again, comes back to the stability of the reference speaker. We need a high quality reference um, that's not going to vary much. And um, the important thing here is that when we equalize the speaker, we really want to equalize it at the level that we want to test our microphone at. Because we know that in most cases, non, um, loudspeakers are pretty nonlinear. So if we equalize a speaker at uh, 80 dB, uh, the, the same equalization might not be proper for operating that same reference speaker at 94 dB or 100 dB. So anytime we want to change our um, test level, we should probably re-equalize our loudspeaker at the intended level of test. And again, the two-channel transfer function, uh, microphone positioning is very critical. And you may need to play around with this on how to get the uh, two microphones, both the reference and the duct, as coincident as possible. Sometimes they can lay on top of each other. Sometimes you want, might want to put them face to face. So there's a lot of guidance out there in some of the literature. And you might want to explore that before uh, trying to use the two-channel transfer function method. OK, so now that we've had a chance to review microphone types, test setups, specifications, we're going to switch over to sound check and demonstrate a couple of the measurement techniques that we discussed earlier. 
And in your sound check installation, there are example sequences for the microphone substitution method and the equalized speaker method. So I'm going to demonstrate both of those to you today in our webinar. So first of all, let's load up the equalized speaker method, and that sequence is called microphone. So as you can see here, when I open up the sequence, the sequence note opens up as well, and it gives us a basic description of what is going to happen here in the sequence. And it's a basic example of the two most common microphone measurements, frequency response and sensitivity. And in this sequence, we use a step sign from 10K to 100 Hertz played through an equalized calibrated source speaker at one Pascal across the measurement range. We analyze the recording with a heterodyne analysis step, which calculates the response curve. And then we take a post-processing step to extract the one kilohertz sensitivity value. And all of that information goes on the final display. So let me minimize this. We're over here in Soundcheck. Let's pop open our sequence editor and just take a quick look at the sequence. It's very, very simple. We have a stimulus step, an acquisition step, analysis step, a post-processing step to derive the sensitivity value. And then we also include two limit step, one that you can apply to the sensitivity value and one that you can apply to the response curve. Uh, they're set for nominal values and you can certainly tailor uh, both of these limits to suit your needs uh, in any sort of environment, be it R&D or production. And lastly, there's a display step where we'll, we'll show the response curves and the sensitivity values. So let's run the sequence and we'll take a look at the results. Okay, so on our uppermost XY graph here, we have the response curve. And this is a relative response curve. So you can see by the units here, we have dBRE1 volt per Pascal. And our microphone is very flat. Looks like there might be a slight offset in the location of our dot mic versus the reference mic that was in there, uh, just because we're seeing a little bit of ripple in the high end. Um, down below, we've taken our fundamental curve and aligned it to 0 dB at 1K. We've got a much smaller y-axis down here, and we have an upper and lower limit applied as well uh, for plus or minus 3 dB. So in this case, the response curve is well within the limits, and we get a passing verdict down below for microphone response. And we also have the microphone sensitivity, which uh, is 22.6 millivolts per Pascal, or actually probably around 34, minus 34 dB RE, one volt per Pascal. So there's a quick look at the equalized speaker method. And now let's switch over to the substitution example sequence. And again, our sequence note opens. It gives us a brief description of the substitution method sequence. And it demonstrates a method for testing microphone frequency response with a source speaker that is not or cannot be equalized. So this is one of the major differences between the two sequences here, is that there is no need to even equalize or calibrate the output signal path. All we're, we really need here is a calibrated reference microphone. And the method involves playing a sign sweep through the source, measuring it with a reference mic, and then we swap out the reference mic for the dot mic, make another measurement, and then do some post-processing to arrive at the response and sensitivity of the dot microphone. So before I run the sequence here, I'm going to have to remove the dot mic here. And I'm going to put the reference mic back into the test position. And let's take a look at the sequence before we run it. So it's a little more complicated than the last sequence, um, and that's really due to the fact that we're going to be doing two acquisition steps here. We're doing one for the reference mic and then one for the dot mic. Uh, after that, we're doing the same 
amount of post-processing here, and you might notice that this example sequence actually doesn't contain any limits, so we won't be applying a limit curve to the response or to the sensitivity value, but you could easily add those steps if you needed to. So let's run the sequence, and then we'll take a look at the results. First, there's a prompt. Just reminds me to make sure that the microphone's been calibrated. Uh, place the reference mic in front of the calibrated source, in front of the source speaker, and press continue. So the first measurement's done. I'm being prompted to remove the reference mic and to replace it with the dot mic. And that's all in place, and I'll press enter to continue. Okay, so here's the final display. Up top here, we actually have the normalized response. And that's coming from our curve division step down here, where we're actually taking the dot mic fundamental and the reference mic fundamental and we're doing some arithmetic post-processing. In this case, it's a division operation, and our work-in mode is linear. So after we do this, the outcome from this step is called normalized response, and that's what we have up here, and that is essentially the frequency response of the dot microphone. You can see here that it's very flat across the measurement range. What we're showing down here are the actual responses of the reference mic in blue and the dot mic in orange here uh, in, in the box. So this is the actual response of the two microphones. And these are the two curves that we're running through the post-processing step over here. And finally, we have our sensitivity value. And it very much aligns with what we saw in the last sequence, about minus 33.6 dB RE1 volt for Pascal. So there you have it, a quick look at the uh, two example sequences that come in sound check for microphone substitution and equalized speaker microphone measurement methods. So that concludes our demonstration for today, and I want to thank you all for attending our webinar, and I just want to remind you that we will be doing another webinar in the future on advanced microphone measurements, and that's going to include polar plotting. We'll get back to a little bit more of looking at um, polar plots of microphones, how to measure them. We'll talk about how to measure the self-noise and signal-to-noise ratio of a microphone. We'll look at some distortion analysis, including THD and intermodulation distortion. Uh, we'll discuss the use of microphone arrays, and we'll also include some very interesting techniques for open loop microphone testing, and that is testing microphones that are embedded in portable devices like phones and tablets. And that pretty much concludes everything for today, and I want to thank you all for watching. So now I'm going to turn things over to our panel to answer your questions, and thanks everybody again for attending.